to this week's edition of Word of Truth Podcast. This is Jordan. And this is Jaron. And uh, so this week we're jumping back in. I know it's been a little bit, but we're going to be looking at a quote by uh, C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity. It's from chapter 12 titled Faith. Um, do you want me just to go ahead and read it to start off? And yeah, then just kind of read so, it, like break it up a little bit. Okay. I'll go, maybe I'll go paragraph by paragraph where it seems like it makes sense. Um, so beginning at the top, it says, I'm trying to talk about faith in the second sense, the higher sense. I have said before that the question of faith in this sense arises after a man has tried his level best to practice the Christian virtues and found that he fails and seen that even if he could, he would only be giving back to God what was already God's own. In other words, he discovers his bankruptcy. Now, once again, what God cares about is not exactly our action. What he cares about is that we should be creatures of a certain kind or quality, the kind of creatures he intended us to be, creatures related to himself in a certain way. And we'll stop there because the other section doesn't necessarily apply um, right away, and I'll jump down a little bit. Um, but kind of starting off with that, so we pick up a little bit in the middle of a context. This is, again... It's in chapter 12, I believe, of book three of his volume, Mere Christianity. So kind of in the middle of a discussion. Um, but in the beginning of this chapter, he's trying to help define what this faith looks like and how to come about it. Um, and so it comes, as he states, it, it is found that when Christians try to his level best to practice the Christian virtues and found that he wouldn't or found that he fails and seen that even if he could, he would only be giving back to God what was already God's own. That was one thing I thought was kind of an interesting point that he makes, is that this faith is based upon the acknowledgement that we have tried our very best to be good, and in doing so, even when we're trying our absolute hardest, we can't achieve the standard, we can't fulfill the law that is set before us. And so we have to take a back, a step back and realize, all right, you know, we, we can't do this on our own. And even, even if we could, all we're doing is giving back to God what's already his. It's our reasonable worship to act as we should act. And we can't even do that really fully all the time on our own. Yeah, I mean, it's like the idea or the concept of a servant. Right. We are servants of God. We go and we work. But what we do in the end is exactly what we're told and commanded to do. So it's out of God's grace and God's mercy that we have salvation. But he didn't have to offer that regardless. He is the authority on all things. And so he has the authority to turn and command us to do these things for we are his creation. So even if we do all these things, even if the Israelites met every command and uh, did everything perfectly by the law. All they did was the commandment that they had. Salvation doesn't have to be offered. And so when we look at this, it's not a discouragement to say, well, then what's the purpose of me even living righteous if I'm not going to be good enough or, you know, or be perfect? Uh, know that you can't do it on your own. Like Paul understood that he could not do it on his own. All the things Paul did, he did for the glory of God with the help of God. Uh, and, and he even talks about how it was God who gave the increase when he would go and he would help plant the seed of the word of God. It wasn't Paul that increased the faith. It wasn't Paul that uh, went and, and, and the faith was built upon. It, it wasn't his blood that purchased the church. Right. Here's. What he did, he just helped. He did what a servant was supposed to do. But it was God working with Paul uh, where you see, you know, what Paul was able to do, all that he was able to accomplish and Peter and others. And what we as Christians today can do, it's not what we do. It's what God works through us by our example. I heard a really good um analogy kind of example of how to explain this kind of relationship um it was a few weeks ago back at work we were having a discussion with a guy and he was kind of talking about this subject 
And he said that he pictures our relationship with God, where our actions are and where God sits reigning over all of it and what we can do. To this time that he was at an airport with his little son, who's like maybe two or three years old. And his son was saying, no, dad, I'm going to carry the suitcase for you. And was trying to carry it with like the wheels, pushing it down a little ramp. And his father was sitting there holding on to the suitcase. And the son's like, look, dad, look what I'm doing. He's like the whole time, though, the dad's holding on to the suitcase, helping to actually like keep control of what it is. And in that relationship, it's kind of like us with our actions where we're the little kid holding on to the suitcase as we're walking. We're thinking, oh, man, look at all this weight I'm carrying. Look at all that I'm doing. But the whole time we should be looking back up to God who has his hand on the suitcase, who's controlling the situation and who is allowing us to do work and wants us to be a part of it. But in the end is all pointing back to him and what he is doing. Yeah, and I think when we talk about this and we look at our salvation, uh, it's important for us to do the works of righteousness, right? That's the fruit of our faith. Uh, So we we have this faith in God, and now we understand his commandments out of our love for him, out of our uh, fear and respect of him, uh, out of our desire to be with him. We're going to do what he commands us to do. We're going to do what is righteous, what is pure, what is holy. But we also have this understanding, like the first century Christians, like those in the Old Testament who were faithful, that ultimately, for us to gain salvation, we need the blood of Christ. Because when we look back, look at what David did and what other faithful examples we have throughout the Bible. They understood here in the future where they have not they don't know what when christ will come or you know the prophets prophesied about him they couldn't wait for that time of christ because they knew when he sacrificed himself for us that blood is what would cleanse us and would wash away our sins and so for us today we can do all that we can we can have the faith we can do all the works we could be like a paul who is, uh, we are just all about and and zealous unto good works with that righteous zealousness going and doing the work of God and being bold. And in the end, it's not going to matter how much we do, how zealous we were, if we don't have that blood of Christ to wash away our sins. Because we need that blood just as it is needed to be applied to those before Christ lived. And I think because a lot of us on a very fundamental intellectual level agree with this statement, I would say you would be hard pressed to find a Christian that wouldn't be able to say and and in some sense mean what we're saying that, you know, in the end, it's not what I do. It's what God has done in the end. I have nothing to give to God because it's all him anyways. And even if I could, I couldn't do it perfectly. But I really like towards the end of the paragraph that we kind of were taken from, which I haven't read it yet, I will in a moment, but kind of the point that C.S. Lewis makes in how we get to the realization of fully understanding what this means. Because as he states in this paragraph, it's going to be only until we have truly exhausted ourselves to the point of not holding anything back, trying our hardest to achieve moral purity or achieve the standard that God has set or achieve fulfilling the law on our own, that only until we have given our best and held nothing back will we come to the realization that I can't do it. It must be God who does the work. I really like how he says that. Picking up where he says, um, of course, any child given a certain religious education will soon learn to say that we have nothing to offer to God that is not already his own and that we find ourselves failing to offer even that uh, without keeping something back. But I'm talking of really discovering this really finding out by experience that this is true. Now we cannot in that sense discover our our failure to keep God's law except by trying our very hardest and then failing. Unless we really try, whatever uh, whatever we say, there will always be something at the back of our minds with the idea that if we try it harder next time, we will succeed in being completely good. Thus in one sense, the road back to God is the road of moral effort of trying harder and harder. But in another sense, it is not trying that is ever going to bring us home. All of this trying will lead us to the vital moment at which we turn to God and we say, you must do this. 
I cannot. And I think that's kind of the key of what we're getting to is it's a, it's a combination of us trying as hard as we can until we realize that within myself, I cannot achieve what is God is calling me to do. And then once you have this realization, the only place you can turn is to look to God. Because once we, as long as we have anything that we can look back to ourselves and say, if I do this better, then maybe next time I'll get it then we're not in the right relationship with God. If there's me involved in this at all, really, and me thinking that by me doing this, that I'm doing anything for myself, it's until we realize that we have the privilege of this gift that God has given from Christ, Christ being hung on the cross and his blood being shed, and that all that's left is for me to look to God and whatever you say, Lord, I will do. I'm your servant. And once this becomes our heart, then we'll start working. We'll realize, all right, if we want to be in this relationship with God, we have to go through the blood of Christ. And once we realize this, we'll realize, all right, now that I have this faith and now that I've been united with Christ through baptism, the next thing that I'm called to do for me to be in this relationship with you, all right, I need to learn about you. I need to know what you call me to do. I need to know what your standard is. And I need to build on this and keep moving forward. But the eye set is always locked on God. God, I am learning from you. What are you telling me? Rather than it being... Uh, go get them, champ. I'm trying. You know, I'm dragging this suitcase. Look at me, dad. It's like, you're doing the work. Just show me what you need me to do. Yeah, and that's where we look at this and and we understand uh, when we talk about how J.R. Bronger was up here um, at Southeast for uh, a gospel meeting just this past year in 2021. And one of his lessons he hit on was, look, we go through, you know, these steps uh, or the plan of salvation. So what we have to do to be saved, you know, before we are to be baptized, you need to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. Logical order, right? You got to build up this faith and this understanding of your relationship between you and God and what you have done. And then you obey his command be baptized to receive the remission of your sins. But when you're there, that doesn't just mean, okay, I've repented once, I'm done. I've made the proclamation or the confession that Jesus is the Son of God once, and I'm done. It's understanding, as we read in Romans 3.23, all men fall short of the glory of God. I'm going to do this work like you were saying. I'm going to try my hardest. Well, I fell. Now you repent again. But you know what happens as you repent and you have that godly sorrow and you change your mindset to no longer my will, but I'm going to do it God's way. You need God, right? You need him. You can keep trying and trying and trying. Maybe if I do it this way, maybe if I focus here, maybe if I. That does it all requires God as well. We have to do the work because we are his servant. And we need to understand that out of our love for him, we want to do his will. We want to be his servant because we desire to be his servant in heaven. At the same time, understand that for us to be able to restart and have day one where we begin again and trying to be faithful and pure and holy in our life, we need the forgiveness of God which comes through the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross. So we have to continually turn to him and see for us to be able to live this life as a Christian, we need to turn to him. Oh, and like in the whole relationship that we have defined with us and God, we're told by Christ multiple times throughout his ministry that we must become like children. And that is the children who inherit the kingdom of God. And this is the mindset. If you think about a child, think about how they act. Their parents can do no wrong. Whatever their parents say, for the most part, they're going to be doing it. They look to their dad as he is the guy who is the superhero in their life. He can do anything. And he usually most children want to be just like their parents. And so that's how we have to take on that mindset is just humbly put all of our faith in him. And it's like, Lord, I I know that I can't really do anything. But whatever you say, whatever example you show, whatever your command is, I want to be just like you. So show me how to do it. And that's how our faith is. It's like it's that kind of uh, almost a recognition of like we have we don't really have this ability, but the desire to fulfill this model that we've been set, you know. 
And so that, that's the dynamic of it. It's a, it's a weird line to kind of cross where it's like, it's fully on our faith and our faith stems and draws out and is shown by our works. Because if you don't have the faith, then me trying to fulfill the law means nothing. If I'm not looking to God the whole time while I'm trying to go and walk this walk as a Christian, then me walking as a Christian is doing nothing for me. But if I'm sitting here looking to God and sitting at his feet, but then I go out and I don't do anything that he says, have I really even put faith in him? Because I haven't looked to him at all. I'm not looking to his example. I'm just sitting at his feet. It's like that, that doesn't show anything. If anything, that shows a lack of faith. Yeah. So that's about the sum total of my thoughts on that, though. <laughs> so I, I think kind of as we just kind of end out here, the point of this is to remember as you go throughout this week, continue to turn to God. You know, it, it's not how many people did I visit? It's not uh, how many righteous acts did I do this week? It's did I glorify God this week? We glorify him by living a righteous life. So am I doing what I do because I want to glorify God or am I doing what I do because I want myself glorified? Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I would think that's a good gist well, of kind of what we have brought up. Yeah, and I was going to say kind of like a concluding thought is we got to stop looking down at our own feet, tracking where we're going. And looking up to the Lord, and Lord, be the light unto my feet and the lamp unto my path. Lord, direct my steps. That's the mindset we need to have. Because as long as we're looking down and trying to micromanage and say, all right, I need to do exactly this and do exactly that, those things will follow if you're looking up to God the whole time and saying, Lord, what is your example? And he will walk you in the path he needs you to walk if you're putting your faith in locking eyes with him. If you lock eyes, you'll lock step and he'll take you where you need to go. As soon as we kind of look down and start looking at our feet, that's when we start getting all crazy. And that's where you you stumble once and you get discouraged. And you're like, I'm just going to try harder and try harder and bring myself back. And then you realize you could have just looked up to God and he would have brought you right back. Again, just so we're clear, this doesn't discourage. This doesn't, we're not saying don't do the works. Do the works. I, do the works of faith. And and we brought that up. That's very, very important. I just want to make sure that we yeah. make this yeah. very clear. Do it. But make sure your heart is right and you're doing it for the glory of God. So if you go and visit, you visit because you want to be with God's people. You want to be with those who are striving to be like him. If you want to help care for others, care for others because you want to show the love of God by helping care for them. If you want to study and learn of his word, it's because you want to learn to be more like him and give him glory. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Wherever your heart is, wherever your eyes are set, that is where your actions will follow. If we're looking to ourselves, we're looking at a fleshly body. We're looking at ourselves who we know are imperfect creatures. If we're looking up to God who is perfect in that example and our heart is towards God and our eyes are locked on him, our actions are going to be an outpouring and following that. If you're walking this way, if you're if you're saying that your eyes are locked with God, but your action aren't following. You have to examine some things. I 100 percent agree. If your heart is locked in and your eyes are locked on God. Then you're going to want to be doing the work. You're going to be going out and visiting people and trying to bring joy and bring people around. You're going to try and shed or uh, spread the gospel. You're going to be doing these things. You're going to veer away from sinful activities and focus on things that are righteous and holy and pure because you're trying to be like God and your eyes are locked and you're following in his, in his steps. You know, and it's it, that's and that's kind of the key is as soon as we stop focusing so hard on obeying the commandments and everything in the law. We have to be careful not to become like Pharisees is the one step. And in doing that, the way that they fell short, Christ, whenever he goes and is talking about them in Matthew chapter 23, is like, it's great that you guys are fulfilling the law perfectly, but you're neglecting the weight of your matters. I would wish that you have done both. Put your heart on God. Focus on him. Your actions will follow and don't neglect the commands. But do them out of a love for the Lord not neglecting these principles of justice, of mercy, of grace. 
it's both. So yeah. On that note, put your eyes on God. Work. Both of them, but with the right heart. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of a Word of Truth podcast. We'd like to give you a friendly reminder that he who has ears to hear, listen, listen up. up. And as always, have a great week.